the idea that uh, Jesus is a legend or a myth. Um, that's making a comeback. Uh, we have people like Robert Price. I debated him on the Reggie Finley show. Um, Internet, uh, what's the name of his program? Uh, Infid the Infidel Radio Guy. But Reggie didn't really give me uh, equal time, so I'd like to debate Price in a more formal debate where it's equal time, where I don't have to answer Reggie's questions. Uh, Price's questions or, or his his he's he's more of a scholar prices than Reggie and uh, but uh, but whatever the case it's it's a very rare view that Jesus never existed um, but it's making a comeback with people like Robert Price you can trace it to uh, G A Wells a historian he was the only uh, well known historian of the 20th century that that rejected Jesus' existence. And so now I debated Doug Kruger, a philosophy professor in State University of New York in Oswego, uh, New York. He's now latching on to this. I think Jeffrey J. Louder. So you, you're getting a lot of pop. Well, you, you're actually getting some New Testament scholars who are jumping on this bandwagon, but it, I'm starting to suspect that the Richard Carriers of this world, the Robert Prices, um, started out their schooling um, denying Jesus' existence and then thinking, okay, no scholar accepts this, but once I get my PhD, I'll be one. And my pupils, they get their PhDs. They'll be. So in other words, it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a view that I don't think that they arrived at through scholarly research, but once you get the PhD, and um, then you could people could say, okay, there's a scholar who holds to it, and so we want to refute that view. Now, um, Richard Price, uh, his views constantly change, and it used to be if there was a passage like in First Corinthians where Paul lists the names of people that Jesus appeared to, First Corinthians fifteen three to eight, he would say, well, verses three through 11 were an interpolation. In other words, somebody later on inserted it. Why does he take it to 11? Because the, it make, if, you, if you just remove verses 3 to 8 from 1 Corinthians 15, it doesn't, verse 2, uh, verse 9 doesn't really follow from it. So he had to take it from verses 3 to 11. So he's a smart guy. And he said that whole thing was interpolation. So I was prepared to refute that because I found in verse 12 and the verses beyond, Paul saying that the apostles have been preaching that Jesus was raised from the dead just like he was. Um, and so I built a case on that. But by the time, from the time he debated Gary Habermas, one of my former professors, and Mike Lacona, till the time he debated me, probably about one year, all of a sudden that wasn't an interpolation in Paul's writings. He didn't believe Paul wrote anything in the New Testament anymore. Uh, and so, uh, you've got seven letters of, of the Apostle Paul that even Marcus Borg of the Jesus Seminar, about probably about 98, 99% of all New Testament scholars will accept Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, Philemon, and what one am I missing? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... You know, I'm missing one more. It'll probably come to me later, but there's there's actually seven letters of Paul that um, virtually all New Testament scholars <coughs> accept, and all of a sudden there I am dialoguing with Price, and now he doesn't believe Paul wrote anything. Um, uh, he's talking with Gary Habermas in North Carolina a couple weeks ago, and um, at Southern Evangelical Seminary. And he told me, he said, he said, oh, you'll never believe where, uh, where uh, Bob Price is now. And I said, oh, I know. He, I said, when I debated him, he denied Paul wrote anything in the New Testament. He said, he's worse than that. And I said, how can he be worse than that? He said, he's arguing Paul never existed. <laughs> so, um, and, and, it, oh, so, and uh, I, told, I told Robert Price, I said, wait a minute, look. 
the apostolic fathers, the pupils of the apostles, selected by the apostles to lead the early church, they wrote between 95 and 156 A.D. So how could these guys think that these other guys existed if they didn't? He said, well, they really didn't write back then. When Irenaeus spoke about them in 180, Irenaeus was lying. These guys were his contemporaries. And he was only pretending that they wrote 80 years earlier. And it's like, it's like nobody agrees with you. So then I called them the Apostle of Denial, and they acted like I was making fun of them. But I mean, it's like, I even asked them, I asked Robert Price, um, uh, do you even believe in the, in the Holocaust? And he said, yes. And I said, why? And he said, because my father liberated one of the camps after World War II. So then I wanted to say the obvious, but Reggie Finley cut me off, and I never really had opportunity to get back. But the obvious response to that, well, what would, what would anybody think of the, the obvious response to a statement like that? That he only he believes in the Holocaust because his father liberated one of the camps. Yeah, well, he, he believed in it because he had, like, first-hand eyewitness. Yeah, so the question, the question to ask is, if your father, if you didn't, you know, if your father hadn't liberated one of the camps, are you saying you wouldn't believe? Yeah. Two generations from now should, you know, based on your view of how to do history, two generations from now, nobody should believe mm -hmm. in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I said, so you're not really a historian, you're an anti-historian. Anti you either have to be an eyewitness or know an eyewitness, and then once you get a generation beyond that, it's just all a big question, right? You know, based on his studies, you shouldn't even, we shouldn't even accept the history, the historicity of Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. And, um, but this is, these are, yeah. oh, and, and what, I, what I told him was, too, I said, if you're going to be consistent, if you're going to be consistent with the way you deal with first century A.D. evidence, New Testament evidence, you'd have to throw out everything from first century A.D. history. Mm -hmm. And he said something along the lines like, uh, I'm okay with that. Hmm. Well, you might be okay with that, but... Uh, but nobody else is. And so basically what it amounts to is these people hate Jesus so much, if they have to throw out large chunks of history, so be it. They'd rather throw out all of history if need be and have no Jesus than um, embrace um, uh, history, but then also have to embrace history, uh, uh, Jesus. Um, let, let me just read a couple passages. Uh, now... Uh, again, as I said, uh, uh, Dr. Craig Evans of Acadia Divinity School states that Dr. Price promotes the discredited Christ myth theory of the 19th century. That's uh, F.C. Bauer. And so he says that uh, Price wants us to ignore 150 years of progress in critical studies. What he's talking about is New Testament critics. They, New Testament critics start out with... Um, you know, the whole Bible's a myth, and we won't accept something unless we have to accept it. Mm -hmm. And then being, they set up these biased principles against the New Testament, but even with the biased principles, little by little they start realizing, wow, we have to accept that if it's historical. Wow, we have to accept that. So, if this is uh, the far left, Jesus never existed, 1870, F.C. Bauer, and if this is the evangelical position, everything in the New Testament is true about Jesus, um, little by little, the, the left of New Testament scholarship is moving closer and closer to the far right of New Testament scholarship. And, uh, but what Price wants to do is, like, I don't like where this is going, let's go back there. But like Craig Evans says, you, you've got to ignore all this historical data in order to do it. Look at uh, the Gospel of Luke. The first few verses. See, what, what Price is saying is that it was a myth. It was religious mythology. And it was probably borrowed from earlier pagan myths. And, um, and that Jesus probably never even existed. Okay? And now just look at the way uh, this is written. Now, the, the Gospel of Luke... Uh, it says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, 
just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having a per uh, had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. And then he goes on to talk about the good news about Jesus' birth and his ministry and his death and resurrection. Uh, this is not the way we read mythology. This is not the way mythology starts. I've researched this, and I want to give you the real historical narrative of what occurred. Mm -hmm. This is, if the apostles are recording mythology and legends, or whoever was writing this, since Robert Price isn't even going to give us anything close to apostolic authorship, now he can't. He's got to acknowledge the first century documents, because we got second century fragments. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, but whatever the case, he's going to. He's going to have to say, he can't say that these guys were uh, mistaken on this. He's going to have to say these guys are lying. So basically, Robert Price, the quote-unquote historian and New Testament scholar, he said, what about this? Well, he's lying. Well, what about that? Well, he's lying. I mean, the Jesus Seminar, the, the far left of New Testament scholarship, he, he claims they're in cahoots with each other for job security. Otherwise, he, he thinks they're far too right. And what? I don't even know if they have any members who believe Jesus rose. That's probably one of the criteria to be a member of the Jesus Seminar. You've got to deny at least his resurrection. Now, the amazing thing is some of the Jesus Seminar members are starting to embrace Jesus' miracles, some of his miracles. And um, now they, they try to explain them in a non-supernatural way. But uh, but Robert Price is like, look, I don't like where they're going. I want to go back to F.C. Bauer. Uh, look at the Acts. Uh, Luke also wrote Acts. The first few verses there. And this is the sequel to Luke. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also prevented himself, presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he, he's writing to Theophilus in the sequel, and he says, look, I've investigated it, and now I'm going to tell you what happened after he rose and appeared to his disciples, and then what happened to the early church after that. This, the, the author of Luke and Acts is claiming to be recording history. Um, this is not the language of mythology. I mean, they're going to tell you who the Roman emperor is. They're going to tell you who the king of Judea is. They're going to tell you who the Roman governor is. They're going to tell you when a census took place. Yeah, and those facts, to say that they're writing mythology, and then they just happen to get all those facts right, you just kind of shoot your argument down. Yeah, yeah. And then they're going to question whether there was a census at this time or not, and blah, blah, blah. But it's just the fact that they're pinpointing, they're, they're trying to say, look, this happened, like Francis Schaeffer said, this happened in space-time history. Francis Schaeffer is saying, look, Karl Barth was wrong when he acted like you have religious history and then real history. And religious history, you, really, you can't really find that in real history. So providing historical evidence for Christianity, Karl Barth thought that was stupid. Well, that just shows that Karl Barth really didn't have anything in common with the Apostle Paul. Paul, I mean, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14 and verse 17, if Christ has not been raised... Um, you're dead in your sins and our faith is useless and our preaching is in vain. Okay? Um, so, um, so whatever the case, it's, it's really clear these are historical documents. I'll turn a couple pages back. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. The Apostle John says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. 
Then you look at the last two verses of John's Gospel, John 21, verses 24 and 25, and the author identifies himself. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote, wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. So then you have throughout the disciple whom Jesus loved is an eyewitness. So the author is claiming to be an eyewitness of these events. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you about these events that I saw, and I'm recording them so that when you see, when you hear about these events, you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. This is not mythology. Mm -hmm. So if Robert Price wants to call this stuff mythology, he's got to call these guys liars. And, um, and, and by the way, you cannot do ancient historical research and just start out assuming these guys are liars. You've got to give the writings, if they're being presented as historical, you've got to give them the benefit of the doubt. It's got to be innocent till proven guilty, true till proven false, not the other way around. So this is just, just this stacking the deck against Christianity just because he doesn't like Jesus. And um, so, uh, by the way, with Luke and Acts, um, which was written first, Luke or Acts? Luke. Luke was written first because they're both written to Theophilus, who was probably some Roman official, most excellent uh, uh, Theophilus. It's like us writing our congressman. Mm -hmm. And what, what do we call a congressman and a senator? Uh, the Honorable Norm Dix. Yeah, the Honorable. Yeah. It's, it's kind of funny that our congressmen are called honorable when they're much more likely to have committed <laughs> crimes than yeah, the, not the average to. American. Uh, um, but, uh, but whatever the case, um, so you have Luke written first and then Acts. Now, can anybody tell me what people died in the book of Acts where their deaths are recorded? <clears throat> Well, Paul wasn't. Okay, yeah, you got Ananias and Ananias Sapphira. And, Sapphira yeah. and who were they? Well, they were two people who died and, and because they lied to the they Holy Spirit. Yeah. So Luke wanted to tell us about it. Well, it was important enough to tell us about it. But they weren't really important characters, They all except for their death. Stephen. Okay, his death um, is recorded for preaching against the temple, but he's really not the main theme of the book, not one of the main characters. Uh, James, the brother of John, he's with the, the Apostle James, he's beheaded by King Herod, uh, but he doesn't play a prominent role in the book of Acts. And then Herod, uh, and I'm not even sure if it's, is it, uh, is it Herod Antipas or Herod Agrippa I? I can't remember which one. I get him confused. I'd have to look at my notes to to see, but one of the Herods, his death is recorded. But the, the two main characters of the book of Acts, who are the two main human characters? Peter and Paul. Peter and Paul. Now, if you had to pick somebody as in third place among uh, the main characters of the book of Acts, who would it be? Mary. Yeah. That no, wouldn't be Mary. I'm sorry to our Catholic friends. Peter, Paul, and Mary. Oh, they, they came along. I'm sorry to our rock and roll friends. Right out on drugs from the 1960s. Yeah. Um, I know Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas was was up there, but uh, I'd argue there's one guy who's an even bigger leader than Barnabas. In the uh, and based on the Jerusalem Council Acts Mark. chapter 15. Mark. And no, not not Mark, but it'd be. James, the half-brother of Jesus. Because uh, a, a lot of it centered in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And when the apostles left, James was in charge. Okay? Now, here's the problem. Why record these guys' deaths when Peter and Paul were put to death somewhere between 64 and 67 A.D.? Why not, why not tell Theophilus, you know... I, Told you so much about Peter and Paul, I might as well tell you when they died. And he's got James in Jerusalem, it's so important. Why not tell him that 
James died in 62 AD. They all died martyrs' deaths. He was thrown off the temple, then they were still alive, so they were stoning him, and then finally the guy bashed his skull in with a club. Uh, Peter was uh, crucified, apparently upside down. Um, Paul was beheaded. Why not talk about their deaths? It doesn't really make any sense. Then you're talking about Jerusalem and the temple has a really big plays a really big role. Mm -hmm. But the author is obviously he portrays Stephen as a hero, and Stephen is saying you don't need the temple because now Jesus came, Messiah came. You don't need the temple. Well, why not throw in there? Yeah, and the temple was destroyed. Now, if that's not God's way of verifying that Stephen was right, I don't know what is. But he doesn't even mention it. So you got the temple destroyed. 70 A.D., not mentioned, even though a lot of the book of Acts focuses on Jerusalem. Uh, you got the Jewish war with the Romans. It started in 66 A.D. and was finished with the destruction of the temple, 70 A.D. No hint at that. Okay? Why is all this stuff left off, left out? Well, what you have, you have unimportant people, as far as Acts is concerned, their deaths are recorded, the important people, and it's left out. Um, important events in Jerusalem, left out. I mean, Josephus tells us, he was a Jewish historian, he wasn't even a, a Christian, he tells us about James' death. Um, and he tells us about the destruction of the temple and the war with the Romans. Of course, Josephus died in 97 AD, he was probably writing 90 to 95 AD. Um, it seems that the author of Acts was writing earlier than that. How much earlier? Acts has a lot of exciting things, but the ending of the book of Acts is anticlimactic, to say the least. Paul's in, been in Rome for two years in chains under house arrest. whoop de doo I mean, that's not exactly... With all the exciting stuff in there, couldn't you have a more exciting ending than that? And so, um, so it actually ends, it's actually 61 A.D., and it ends with Paul in Rome. Why do you end in 61 AD with Paul in Rome when after 61 AD you had all this exciting stuff and that's left out? Well, chances are Luke just wrote right up to the present day and then mailed it off to Theophilus. In other words, there's no good explanation as to why Acts would have been written after 61 AD. If it was written in 63 AD, it would at least record the death of James. If it's, I mean, this is the history of the early church. These are the three big guns, and you don't record their deaths. Um, so Acts was written in 61 A.D. I don't care if it's Robert Price or Marcus Borg. Uh, I'm willing to debate anybody on that issue. I think the evidence is so strong for it. But that means Luke had to be written before that. And I think you can argue for somewhere between the mid-40s and the mid-50s A.D., and, um, in fact, a, a lot of the argument for Jesus is a myth is based on Paul wrote first before the Gospels, and he doesn't talk about uh, the life of Jesus. Well, several things can be mentioned. Number one, it's not his purpose to write about the life of Jesus. He already preached to these people that he's writing to. Secondly, he assumes, he presupposes that they already know about the life of Jesus. Okay? Uh, now, that, does that mean that he and, he and his colleagues, like Luke was one of his colleagues, maybe they told the people through word of mouth they preached the gospel. Then again, maybe Luke wrote his gospel before Paul even started his trips, and Paul may have, you know, had Luke make a copy for them. But Paul, when you read it closely, you see that he presupposes his readers already know about the, the facts about the life of Jesus. And number three, just what he mentions in passing, he's not teaching them about the life of Jesus, but he just mentions things in passing. You can piece together about 30 different events from the life of Jesus, and you get a pretty good, I mean, the, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, I mean, that's all over the place in his writings. Um, but... Um, but whatever the case uh, in Galatians, which is accepted by, by virtually everybody except for Robert Price, even Marcus Borg will give you Galatians. Uh, did you realize that Marcus Borg and, um, and even Gerd, Gerd Ludmann, the leading German uh, 
New Testament scholar and, and theologian. Um, he, Ludman, actually acknowledges that 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, Gary Habermas argues that it was written between 33 and 37 AD, that creed, and then Paul quotes it around 55 AD to the Corinthians. Uh, Ludman says no, Paul probably got that when he got saved. And in Damascus, the Christians that were there, some of them had fled from Jerusalem and Paul was chasing them. He probably got that creed from them. So Ludman says this creed was made within one year of the crucifixion. So, so you get you now. Now Marcus Borg will say he'll give you about about three to five years after the crucifixion. So, so basically, the Jesus seminar is going to give you that Jesus was a historical figure, and that his apostles, the, his followers, actually taught that he had risen from the dead and appeared to them within a few years of his crucifixion. Um, so that's the kind of evidence we can work with. Um, and you don't get legends and people willing to die for, th for these stories that soon while the eyewitnesses are still alive. Uh, but these guys are going to try to try to not give you any of that. And I, and I argue that they're, it's really weak. But Acts 61 AD, Luke had to be written um, earlier. Um, okay, uh, let me give you eight assumptions. Um... Uh, of the uh, uh, legendary Jesus theorist. By the way, two really good books written on this um, are by um, Gregory Boyd and um, Paul Eddy. And they're, one's called like the Jesus Legend and the other one is something to do with legend in the title as well. Uh, also, Ronald Nash's book uh, uh, Christianity and the Greeks, I believe is the title. Um, where he shows that it didn't, it wasn't founded. Uh, the, the early church did not borrow from the ancient pagan myths. But um, I think we're going to probably end up spending a few weeks on this, and um, so I'm just going to try to cover a little bit more ground. Uh, but let's take a look at the assumptions that these guys have, and Eddie and Boyd list these. First is. Uh, Naturalism, basically miracles are impossible. Okay, now it, this is the only thing I tried to prove in my debate against Doug Kruger. I hope someday we're going to get the video on that, but. Um, the Christians who filmed it, I'm, I'm just not getting... They keep telling me every time I email them that they're going to send it to me, and they never have yet. But um, that debate was, is belief in the resurrection reasonable? And so I just argued that if you can be a reasonable person and believe that Jesus rose from the dead, because that's where the historical evidence points. My whole thesis was all the first century evidence teaches that Jesus rose from the dead... There's no first century evidence denying that he rose from the dead. Um, and that if somebody's going to deny it, it's probably not because of historical evidence, because all the historical evidence is in its favor. Um, it's probably because they're biased against miracles. So they're really not rejecting the resurrection because of historical reasons. They're rejecting it because of a philosophical bias against miracles. This is what the philosophers call an a priori rejection of something or an a priori belief rather than a posteriori. This is post. This is after. This would be after examining the evidence. You say, okay, he rose or he didn't ro rise. A priori, you make your mind up before you looked at the evidence. And that's what I would argue is that, and I don't even believe that you have to believe miracles definitely happened before you would accept the resurrection. I think you just need to say, hey, I'm going to be unbiased. I'm going to be open to the possibility of miracles. Okay? And now let me look at the historical evidence. Well, then I think if you're going to be honest, you'd come down on the side, Jesus did rise from the dead. Um, 
uh, but these guys a priori reject it. So it's a philosophical bias against miracles. And that's what I tried to show that, that Kruger was doing. I even quoted from his book where he, where he said that uh, he's, he's an author of a book on atheism and um, defending atheism. And he said that uh, he, he uh, referred to David Hume positively saying that David Hume um, believed it was impossible to prove, historically prove a miracle. And I said, do you still believe that? And he was like, I wrote that. And I said, yeah, I'm quoting from your book. And he's like, okay, I guess I did change my mind. Well, he had to say that he changed his mind, which made him look bad. Because the only alternative was, okay, I've been lying to you. I said that, you know, let's look at the evidence and see if the evidence favors the resurrection or goes against it. Well, here the guy is saying right in his book, no matter how much historical evidence you have, you can never prove a miracle. And so what I was trying to prove in that debate is, this guy rejects the resurrection because he's biased against miracles, not because of the lack of any historical evidence. Now, I, in other words, I would say, let's just suppose Jesus rose from the dead in the first century A.D., and they were Jews controlled by the Romans. What kind of evidence would you expect to see? And I, I would argue that you'd expect to see pretty much what we see right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what do we have, 41 or 42 mentions of Jesus um, within 150 years of his life? And um, uh, now, probably about 31 or 32 of those are from Christians. But still, it's like, it's like we get penalized. It. Yeah, well, this guy says he saw the you know Jesus risen, but he's a Christian, so that doesn't count. So it's kind of like, so I guess um, I guess if a guy was um, if a Jew was in a concentration camp, his testimony doesn't count because he was Jewish and was uh, a victim. That's, like, that's absurd. Yeah. Or if an atheist says there's no God, he's disqualified. Yeah. Because he yeah. Doesn't believe in God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. He's just saying there's no God because he's an atheist. So that doesn't make sense at all. Uh, and, and you expect people who see Jesus, Jesus risen from the dead, you know, people, by the way, we Christians are just plain incorrect when we say that Jesus only appeared to his disciples. Hmm. It, at least two of the guys were skeptics or enemies, you know, Paul and James, the half-brother of Jesus, when he appeared to them. Well, so not everybody, not everybody was pro-Jesus when Jesus appeared. Now, once he appeared, they changed their views. Mm -hmm. Uh, but let's say, let's say of the 500 people that Jesus appeared to, let's say two of them were anti-Christians. Two of this big group of 500 people were anti-Christians. And even though they saw Jesus risen from the dead, they refused to accept it. Would you expect them to write about it? No. They're going to keep it to themselves. They're not going to let people know if they don't want to follow him. Now, the two people that Jesus met on the road... It was after his resurrection. Well, he on the road to Damascus, that was Paul. No, 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 no. not Paul. Oh, yeah. oh you talked to the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Yeah. yeah, and they were sitting there going, they didn't know who he was, and they were thinking, oh, yeah, that was, they were doubting. Mm -hmm. They, I mean, that was that's a yeah. good point right there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, even with with doubting Thomas, mm -hmm. it's like you know he was saying the, to them, the other apostles, well, I know you guys, I trust you guys, but you guys are just out to lunch. I'm not going to believe yeah. unless I see him and I put my 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 fingers and his wounds, um, but uh, but yeah, every one of these, none of them expected to see. In fact, it's one of the strongest arguments for the resurrection is the fact that there was nothing, and we're going to see this as we go further. There was nothing in pagan literature for anybody to get a full blown bodily resurrection, but there was also nothing in Jewish literature. We now think of, oh yeah, there's several clues and predictions of Jesus' resurrection in the Old Testament. Yeah, but God made them so vague that nobody knew they were predictions of the Messiah's resurrection until after he rose. Mm -hmm. And then you read the Old Testament with New Testament light, and you see, oh, God said that he would not allow his Holy One's body to see decay. So Peter, in Acts chapter 2, he's preaching on that, and he said, now look, David couldn't be speaking about himself. We could visit his tomb to this day, and his bones are still there. Yeah. 
Now, we know God's word doesn't fail. So what David wasn't talking about himself, who was he talking about? He must have been talking about his descendant, the Messiah. And we are witnesses that he did rise from the dead. By the way, New Testament scholars, the vast majority of them will give you the sermons of Acts chapter 2 through 12 as the earliest preaching of the gospel. And it's all, you know, Jesus rose from the dead. So basically... The concept of bodily resurrection among the Jews was a general resurrection of all the faithful at the end of time. There was no conscious teaching that Messiah was going to be raised as an individual. So this was not something the apostles suspected. They would not get it from Judaism. They certainly wouldn't get it from paganism. The only way they could have gotten it, uh, and it explains the origin of Christianity, is if they actually saw him risen from the dead. Yeah. Uh, so Jesus 41 mentions within 150 years of his death and Tiberius Caesar, the emperor of Jesus' time, only 10 mentions. So why would you mention an insignificant Jewish carpenter four times as many times as Tiberius? Now, you know, we probably lost a lot of literature, so Tiberius might have been mentioned maybe 50 times, but Jesus might have been mentioned two or 300 times. But what we've got is what we got, and that's what you do history with. So, um, so first thing we have to understand, the Jesus legend theorists, um, they start out with the assumption miracles are impossible, so we've got to find a different um, uh, explanation. Well, also, first century Jews, especially Galilean Jews, were Hellenistic Hellenistic, if not pagan. Hellenistic means, in other words, what they're trying to argue is that the Jews were more Greek, Hellenism, more Greek, if not just straight out pagan. And, uh, and believe me, all the evidence goes against that. They still, even in Galilee, they still to this day uh, um, haven't found coins with images on it. Um, it makes me wonder where, where Jesus got the coin with the image with Pilate's mm -hmm. face on it because that was not common in Galilee. And you find synagogues, you know, these guys are assuming that the ancient Jews couldn't even write. And uh, yet, what were synagogues for? To train people to study the Old Testament. Um, okay, they also believe that there's legendary... Parallels to Jesus' story. We're going to see that these parallels, by the way, they sound scary. And um, because it sounds so much, when these guys start, you know, describing Apollonius of Tyana, we'll talk about him next week probably, it sounds so much like Jesus. I even got nervous when I first heard. Then when I start finding out, it's, it's in their telling of the story where they make it sound so Christian. They start using Christian terminology and stuff that really isn't there. Um, they also assume the silence about Jesus in ancient non-Christian writings. You say, well, what about Josephus? He recorded that Jesus was executed, crucified under Pontius Pilate, but then the apostles claimed that they saw him alive after his death. And um, uh, they say, well, yeah, uh, Christian added that. It really didn't say that. And they just go right down the list, and each and every one of these, these guys is, oh, yeah, but that's really, that really, he really wasn't referring to Jesus or whatever. And they either say, look, either a Christian added this or added that, or they say, well, this passage in, in Thallus, uh, they say, well, Africanus lied, and Thallus never really wrote about the darkness of Jesus' crucifixion in 52 AD. They would say uh, Tacitus, or Suetonius, or Hadrian, or uh, Trajan, or Pliny the Younger. They would say, well, this is information. Yeah, they thought Jesus had existed, you know, 50, 60 years earlier, but they got this information from the Christians who are making up this myth. 
So everywhere you get, so you got Roman governors, Roman emperors talking about Jesus, and they're all fooled by these Jews making up stories. Okay? And very, very convenient. And so, so, so basically what they do is they take all the witnesses from non-Christian ancient literature, and they explain it away. And they say, well, they say, why should we believe in the resurrection? I mean, nobody, no ancient non-Christian wrote about Jesus. And he said, well, I just gave you ten. So yeah, but I don't accept those ten. So it's like Norman Geisel used to say during his debates. He said, basically, your case is this. Apart from all your evidence, you don't have a case. And then Geisel would say, but that's it. My case is the evidence. You can't just ignore the evidence and then throw out my case. Uh, okay, number five. Uh, silence about Jesus' life in Paul's writings. Both F.F. F. Bruce and then the historian uh, Paul Barnett, New Testament scholar as well, um, they can give you about 30 different facts from the life of Jesus found in Paul's writings. And almost always, too, almost all of those 30 facts are found in the seven accepted epistles. Because these guys know that we're arguing with guys that don't accept first and second Timothy and oh first Thessalonians was the seventh book that I forgot to uh, to list. Um so what they claim silence in Paul's writings, no, you can actually reproduce much of the high points of Christ's life, death and resurrection from Paul's writings. Um uh, then they also would say that uh, there is unreliable oral traditions behind the Gospels. See, what you do is you just take the Gospels, liberal scholars take the Gospels, okay, and they say, well, we don't think that these are the Gospels were written between 70 and 110 A.D. Now, by the way, Marcus Borg, one of the radicals from the Jesus Seminar, but their most famous scholar, him and John Dominic Crossan, he acknowledges that John was probably written in the 90s A.D. And it was the last of the Gospels written. So Marcus Borg will give you 70 to the mid-90s A.D. Um, but they say, well, Jesus died in 30 A.D. And so between this time and this time, okay, you have um, nothing but oral tradition. And that's where they say the legends were, were developing. Okay? Several problems with this. Um, one thing is, maybe those dates shouldn't be there. John Wenham argues, tries to, he pushes Matthew's Gospel to the 30s A.D., Luke and Mark to the 40s A.D., James Charlesworth out of Princeton, he's not even evangelical, now dates uh, John's Gospel to the mid-50s A.D. John says the temple was still, parts of the temple were still standing when he was writing. Um, the theological thought forms are very close to the Jewish theological thought forms of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and James Charlesworth is one of the foremost experts on both the New Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls. He says John was written mid-50s A.D. I was going to say, it's more reasonable just mainly, you know, the temple argument. It's more reasonable to push yeah. everything before 70 A.D. than to push everything after it. There's no mention yeah. anywhere. But and it was a, a, uh, John A.T. Robinson, uh, the redating the New Testament. I confuse his name with A.T. Robertson. I think it's John A.T. Robinson, who was a liberal scholar, and he started realizing that all the garbage he had been taught was exactly that, garbage, and he dated all the New Testament books before 70 A.D. Now, I, I'm open to 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation being written after 70 A.D., um, but I think his view is much closer. Because basically, if you're not going to talk about the temple being destroyed, since Jesus predicted it, if you're not going to talk about it as how it happened, then that's because you're right before it was destroyed. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, but whatever the case, uh, Boyd and Eddie go to great lengths showing, go to oral cultures, and their oral tradition is incredibly accurate. See, everybody wants to talk about everybody wants to talk about where the resurrection accounts differ. You know, one angel or is it two angels? Well, you know, it's like if you 
if somebody says, well, Pat, who was at the, the study Tuesday night? He said, well, Don was there. And, uh, and, then, then, and then the guy finds out that your wife was there, too, and I was there. And he says, you lie. You said Don was there. He said, well, I thought you, you know, you knew that Doc teaches it. So Phil's there, and my wife goes to the study with me, so I thought you knew that she was there, and I just could have mentioned that Don was there as well. So, he, so you, But if you said only Don, you'd be lying. The Gospels don't say only one angel. Nope. Um, so, uh, but, but people don't want to talk, what do they have in common? Well, all the reports we have in the New Testament say he died by crucifixion, rose from the dead, was buried, rose from the dead on the third day, and, and made several appearances before ascending back to heaven. Now, when I was a cop, when I did law enforcement, if I get that kind of agreement on the main points, and there's apparent discrepancies on the other points, it just shows different perspectives. Um, but we've got main core, and if I don't act on that main core, I get in trouble. I could lose my job. And uh, so, whatever the case, but that's that's number six. And we'll just cover the, the next two. And then maybe uh, let's erase the top ones here. Oops. Number seven. Uh, well, the boy, boy and Eddie show, even if you assume a late date for the Gospels and a 40 year gap, uh, oral societies. Um, you can retain an amount of information bigger than the entire Bible, let alone just the Gospels. Um, and what you, what you end up, they call oral tradents. It's their job, their family's job, to memorize these things and teach these down, teach these. And you always have to get the core facts right. And um, we see that in oral societies today that don't have a written language. And they, 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 these two or three guys can quote for you. Um, traditions that haven't changed in hundreds of years um, because they're so strict with it. But Boyd and, and Eddie would also argue the apostles probably take take probably took notes. Uh, Matthew thir chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 23. In passing, Jesus refers to the uh, apostles as scribes, and scribes are scribes because they scribble, not because they memorize. Now, so the apostles did memorize stuff, but they also took notes and. Uh, uh, but number seven, uh, they, they claim the Gospels. Are contradictory and unreliable. You know, and that's what uh, Doug Kruger was trying to do in our debate, was trying to argue for that. And it's like, look, this is not a debate about the Bible being inerrant without any contradictions and all. Uh, it's not even a debate about is the Bible historically reliable. It's, is the Bible correct in that it reports that Jesus was dead and then he rose from the dead and he appeared? That's all we're looking at. Now, the, the thing is, once you acknowledge that he rose from the dead, uh, and then you look at his view of the Old Testament and what he promised about the coming New Testament, then uh, you can begin to argue for the Bible being without contradictions and reliable and inspired of God, but I would argue for the resurrection first. Um, but these guys, it, it's amazing how many things they call contradictions um, that are so easy to resolve. And these you, you got to give ancient authors the benefit of the doubt. Plato sounds like he contradicts himself from paragraph to paragraph. All that shows us he's a profound thinker, and you got to put your thinking cap on to figure out what he's talking about. And uh, uh, but they don't give that common courtesy to the New Testament. And then also they argue that the burden of proof rests on those who argue for the reliability of the Gospels. So they say burden of proof rests on basically Bible believers. So, I mean, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty smart move that Robert Price and these guys take. You just, uh, you look at the 27 books of the New Testament, okay? 
you look at um, the writings of the Apostolic Fathers from 95 to 156 AD, you look at all the writings of non-Christian writers who mention Jesus, you take all this stuff, all these 42 uh, uh, writers, and which means even more writings than that, um, but you take all these different authors and you just say, okay, I don't accept any of those. And then once you say, I don't accept any of those, then it's easy to say, yeah, now the burden of proof rests on you. It's like, look, you just burned all of my evidence. I had a library's worth of evidence. You just toss it aside as if, you, as if a good historian could do that and still call himself a good historian. You just toss all my evidence aside and say, now the burden of proof rests on you. Now, if we just accept the, all the first century evidence, uh, the burden of proof is on them. Mm -hmm. 